G'day folks, welcome to this review of War of the Ring, including the three core expansions. The Lords of Middle-earth expansion, the Warriors of Middle-earth expansion, and the relatively new Kings of Middle-earth expansion. Now there are some various promotional expansions, there's a Treebit expansion, the Erebor expansion, uh, and the like, but these are the, really the three core larger box expansions that you can get for the second edition of War of the Ring. So in this video, I'm going to talk about the three expansions, what they add to the game. I'm going to give you my opinion on the value they add to the game. I'm going to talk about which one you should, well, you should get all of them, they're all great, but I'm going to sort of give an assessment of which I think adds the most to the game. I'm going to talk about playing with them all together. So playing with the, the Lux, the, this is the second edition and all three expansions. Firstly, uh, probably the smallest, cheapest one to get, Lords of Middle-earth. This adds several characters uh, to the game. It gives you eight plastic figures, five special action die, 11 cardboard counters, 28 event and character cards, plus the game rules. The main thing this adds is a series of, of new uh, personalities which bring with them um, some special abilities, in particular some new dice that you can add to your dice pool. Effectively um, giving you an extra action to take on your turn when you bring these characters in. So I will say also from, from, the, from the start I typically play as a free people's player. So I have far more familiarity with all of these expansions from the free people's player side. So I can talk more about the free people's additions to the game compared to uh, the shadow player. So this expansion for the free people's player in particular, it adds Galadriel and Elrond, the potential for them to bring in extra dice, plus some revised rules around Gandalf and the Fellowship. There are some optional rules around alternative uh, fellowship companion capabilities. Um, but yeah, it's that Elrond, Galadriel, Gandalf special rules and dice that, that, that come with the game that is probably the most distinctive feature of this expansion. It effectively, and, and the, the, these three characters effectively sort of supplant, replace, enhance the elven ring rules. In the base game, you get three elven rings and you can use these rings once each to change the face of a free people's player uh, dice to a result you want, aside from World of the West. These expansions enhance that. They give you special abilities uh, and special characters that you actually place on the map. So Elrond can actually go in Rivendell and he has a special ability there which treats elven elite units as leaders. Galadriel can go in uh, Lorien and she has a special ability which enables her, I think from memory, to uh, recruit in Lorien even if it's under siege, things like this. So same with the Shadow Player game, I'm not overly familiar with them, but they add new characters with special abilities. The Balrog comes out in Maria, very powerful, uh, things like that. So they're adding new characters to the board. Okay, that's the, the Lords of Middle-earth expansion. The next one is Warriors of Middle-earth. This adds factions, and you can see the faction sheets for the Shadow Player down the bottom here. It adds three factions for the Shadow Player and three factions for the free people's player, plus a faction activation die. Uh, one for the free peoples, one for the shadow player. This, the, the factions effectively st are treated much like the fellowship in the sense that they exist on the board, but it's difficult for the opponent to attack them. They kind of exist and they implement special rules that sit on top of the existing rules. So they don't really replace much in the base game, rather they add another layer on top. Um, so for the free people's player, they get the dead men of Dunharrow, they get the treants and they get the elves and they have very different capabilities. The dead men in particular, they're, they're main value is being able to scare away shadow player armies. So they can, by playing a faction card, they can attack 
a shadow army, and after that combat, that shadow army has to retreat. The treants effectively do damage, typically to Saruman's forces. While the elves can fly around, they can scare away Nazg uh, yeah, Nazgul, and they have a really good range. Okay. The shadow player have the Hillmen of Dunland, they join Isengard, they have the Corsairs of Umbar, all right, so these, these ships that their main event is being able to sail rapidly up and down the coast, and they have the broods of Shelob spiders who can effectively join in, in, in combat coming from around sort of Mordor area. So this adds, it adds new forces to the map, but they don't necessarily, they don't all necessarily join your army, rather they complement your army, they sit on top of your army, much like, much like having a companion in a battle. Think of it like that. Um, but typically you'll need to have, I mean, you, they also bring in um, what are called call to battle cards. So instead of playing a combat card, you bring in these call to battle cards and they are special abilities that if you meet the conditions, so if the army of the dead, this is my army of the dead here, so if they are in the same region or adjacent to my defending free people's army, I can use this. At the end of the round, I can eliminate a dead man figure from the army of the dead to end the battle. Or I can play this one. Eliminate a dead man figure from the army before the combat roll. Roll an additional attack using three dice, scoring hits on a four plus. So they, as I said, they don't sit with your army, but they complement your army in a way. So that is the Warriors of Middle-earth expansion. It adds those factions to the game. The faction die roll, which you'll roll to bring these faction in and, and fix factions in and play cards. The most recent expansion is Kings of Middle-earth. And this is much like Lords of Middle-earth in the sense that it adds new characters to the game, but in a, in a very new system. So it doesn't replace anything in the game. Again, it adds to it. It adds the new Sovereign Corruption Board and five new sovereigns to the game. These are five new characters. Bran uh, for the North, Dane Ironfoot for the Dwarves, Denethor for Gondor, Theoden for Rohan, and Thranduil for the Elves. So these are, they start on the board, they start as effectively neutral characters, and both the Free People and the Shadow player are trying to sway them to their side. For the Free People's player, they need to awaken these sovereigns, typically by bringing their nation to war and then meeting certain, certain conditions to activate them. The shadow player has a slightly different and more engaging way of corrupting these sovereigns. They will take eye dice from the eye pool and then draw corruption tokens from the pool and then secretly place corruption face down on those characters. When the corruption on those characters reaches their corruption limit, they effectively become corrupted and become corrupted sovereigns. So you can see here in the game we've just played, this is a corrupted Theoden. He, when he becomes corrupted, he prevents Rohan from recruiting, from taking a recruitment action. When Denethor, if Denethor were to become corrupted, he prevents Gondor from taking a recruitment action. If they become activated, they give the Free People's player benefits. Uh, it enables them to enhance their recruitment ability. Uh, Thrandil, for example, was very critical in our game. He's way up in the north, in the Woodland Realm. He enables the elves to upgrade regular units to elite units in the Woodland Realm when he's activated. So for whatever player gains control of this, and you can see, in Helm's Deep here. So because Theoden was corrupted, when Sauron, when the forces of Isengard, Saruman captures Helm's Deep, it turns Helm's Deep into a shadow player stronghold. So it really enhances the abilities of the player who gains control of those. This expansion also introduces uh, several what are called dark chieftains into the game. These are three additional uh, shadow nation uh, leaders. The Black Serpent, the Shadow of Mirkwood, and Ugluk. 
And they are effectively, they're referred to as sort of lesser minions. They're kind of like characters that help lead your shadow armies into battle. So there's the five sovereigns who can swing either side. And then there's the three dark chieftains which go with the shadow player. Okay, so this again, it kind of sits on top of the game. It doesn't change any of the rules. It's a new system that sits alongside the game board. Uh, from memory, none of the base rules are changed. It just adds that extra option. In particular, the biggest benefit of this, uh, well, there, there are benefits for having these, these chieftains, these yeah, sovereigns swing to your side, but it gives, what it, what it really does is it gives the shadow player the ability to use eye results from their pool. So on a turn, if they find themselves rolling a lot of eyes and having five eye dice in their pool, then they can, as long as the free people's player has an action dice available, they can take one of these eyes out and they draw tiles equal to the remaining eyes. eyes. So if I remove one from here, they can draw three, one, two, three. They choose one and place it on the chieftain, the sovereign, sorry, that they're trying to corrupt. It gives them that, that option in case they roll too many eyes, which can be very important for the, the shadow player. At the same time, the benefits, it's fair to say, I think on balance, the benefits tend to really help the free people's player. If the free people's player can awaken these sovereigns, it can really help them in protecting the free people's strongholds. I mean, Thrandall was critical in the game we've just played. He was upgrading these elven elites to regulars, which is really, really powerful in, uh, yeah, in a defensive situation. Okay, so that's, that's what the three expansions do. That's kind of an overview of what they do. Let's assess them and kind of talk about what value they add to the game. In my opinion, I'm gonna start with what I think is the most valuable and the one that I'd recommend you get, and it's Warriors of Middle-earth. If you were only to get one of these expansions, I recommend you get this one. The use of the factions, uh, not only does it add the miniatures to the game board, you can see here are the Corsairs down here. We didn't see spiders much, didn't see the hillmen much in this particular game. Typically we do. Um, but I have my dead men of Dunharrow here. I have my treants here. I have my elves up in the north. They all play a role. And the fact that it doesn't change in the rules, but it's another layer on top. So the free people's player, they get their one faction die per turn. They are rolling this. They're either recruiting typically or playing a faction card. Now the faction cards are an entirely new deck of cards. And you're typically drawing typically drawing at least one of these per turn. And they just add a suite of new events that are unique to your factions. Typically, as I said, the dead men are attacking and scaring away shadow players' armies, which is a, a new tool at their disposal. So this, this adds, I think, the most, what can I say? It has the biggest impact on gameplay without taking anything away from the existing game, rather just adding a lot of flavor, a lot of theme, it adds to the narrative. I would highly recommend Warriors of Middle Earth adding that to your gameplay. Okay, number one, you should get that. The other two are pretty much on par. They're adding new characters, um, adding some theme, but mainly through characters. Okay, so this is the Warriors of Middle Earth is actually adding, literally, warriors to the game. It's adding soldiers that you fight with, miniatures to your game. Both of these will add characters. Both expansions add characters to your game, um, <clears throat> but they're not, and they're important, don't get me wrong, but they're not, I guess they're not quite as exciting as the Warriors of Middle-earth. They have their little subtle abilities in the game we've just played, for example. So we've just finished the game with all three expansions. Galadriel and Elrond did not appear. They're sitting off on their elven ring track doing nothing. So this expansion in the game we've just played. The Shadow Play did bring out some of their characters, but yeah, there may be minimal impact from this expansion. Kings of Middle-earth is, is similar. I would argue it's a slightly enhanced version of Lords of Middle-earth. It does much of what Lords of Middle-earth does, but with more characters. 
So as I said, you've got the five sovereigns. What's fascinating about this is those sovereigns can become five shadow sovereigns, five free people sovereigns, or three shadow, two free people. They can split in either direction. So you've got, again, this whole other contest going on. As these corruption points are secretly adding up, because the free people's player won't know what's going on here. As these points are adding up, the free people's player is getting concerned, but they can act on this. They can send companions to Thranduil and convince him not to become corrupted, in effect. Or they can activate him, which instantly turns him towards a free people's activated sovereign. So yeah, this is probably my, my recommendation for second. This is such a small expansion, it, it, it subtly tweaks the Elven Ring system and adds some nice characters. It's probably the cheapest of the three, so it's, it's easy to add. This has the biggest impact, and then this one, and then Lords of Middle-earth. In my opinion, none of them are bad. None of them take anything away from the game. None of them add anything negative to the game. They do add new considerations. They add new rules. They add factions. They add new leaders, new dice, new sovereigns. So they add to your considerations. It's hard to say where the balance lies. Um, certainly, as I said, Thranduil is critical. Galadriel is very helpful for defending Lorien. Uh, <laughs> the dead men are amazing for helping to defend Dol and Roth in the south. Um, so they all do different things. And I know this from the, the Free People's Player, where they help me and how they help me. From the Shadow perspective, you know, the Shadow player needs to be able to respond. It changes their strategy. They'll need to think differently about how they're going to manage. If there's a lot of dead men in, in uh, Erith, Eric down here, they might want to think twice about attacking Dol Amroth. They might want to think about a different strategy. So all it does is it adds some more context to your considerations. Okay, so as I said, first recommendation, second recommendation, third recommendation, but they are all good. These are not sort of, this is not bad. It's, it's very good, adds to the game, but in the smallest way and so on, biggest impact here. Okay, so what is it like to play with all three at the same time? There's a lot going on, fair to say. Um, but because the actions, they're almost sort of compartmentalized. So the, the Warriors of Middle-earth, okay, so they, they are mainly activated through your faction activation dice. When you play, when you roll, you roll this with your other activation dice, Based on the result, you're either sort of recruiting or activating a faction or you're drawing a faction card or playing a faction card. And when you want to use this, you just know that you, you get your hand of, of action cards, faction, faction, action cards. You look at what faction you want to activate. So if, if Dol and Roth is being attacked, I'm looking at the dead men and I decide whether or not this is relevant for the situation. In this case, this, active, this action card won't really help me right now. So maybe I'm looking at the Ents up here and I'm looking to see what they can do. Okay, they can move and attack. So maybe this would be a better situation. So I simply use that to play the card to then activate the Ents and do what the card says. It's fairly, it's fairly straightforward. There's not a, not a huge rules overhead. Um, the rule books look impressive. They are... They are, well, the, the, the Laws of Middle Earth one is the simplest, and it is 31 pages long, but really, on, honestly, it is quite a simple, um, it's fairly easy to grasp. Okay, so playing with them all, as I said, there's, there's a lot going on. There are a lot of rules additions, but it's fairly easy to integrate within your existing game. Um, the summary sheets, I mean, we... we Barely even, cons I don't think I even consulted this through the game we just played. That's how easy it is to sort of integrate and understand. A lot of the, so you roll this dice, you do, it gives you an additional action, but you know the actions already. There's a character action, a muster action, an eye action, which will go in the, the hunt pool. Um, so it just, again, it doesn't change the rules. Often it's just adding to the rules. It gives you another dice if that character is out in play, basically. And the cards, the character cards that come with the game, uh, quite conveniently summarize, for example, how does Lord Elrond come into play? Well, the elves need to be at war, um, Rivendell unoccupied, un un unconquered, and you can use an action, a muster action die. 
And you can meet those conditions and Elrond enters play. Very straightforward, all summarized on that card. What does he do? Again, it's all summarized on that card. You don't need to consult the rules. But as you can probably see by all the cards we have in front of us, all right, so these are the, the shadow player factions and characters, and off in the distance you can see the free people's factions. It adds a lot, and it adds a lot to your consideration and your thinking. So the free people's player at the present, right? if I move this out of the way, they have got all three factions in play. They've got the elves, uh, the elves, the eagles, the treants, and the dead men. So there's three considerations they're making. Then they've also got, uh, let me come around and have a look. They've brought out Gandalf the White. Aragorn has died. Actually, Gandalf the White is dead as well. He died right at the end of the game. Um, they've got you know, normal events that have come to play. They've got two of these sovereigns. They've got Thrandil and Denethor. So they're in play. He needs to, you know, the free people's play needs to consider that. Then there is the, the normal rules for the fellowship, the companions that have been separated from the fellowship. All this means is there's a, there's a lot, there's a lot more information in front of you. Um, a lot more. I can't quite pin around to the the the, free, the shadow players cards, but they've got five, six, seven, eight, nine cards in front of them, characters and ongoing events, plus nine plus only one faction in play, but potentially two more. It doesn't feel overwhelming. Okay, yes, there's a lot of more information, but I do want to say it doesn't feel overwhelming, particularly if you've built up. So we added, we, had, we played a lot of the base game. Then we added Warriors of Middle Earth. Then we added Lords or vice versa. So we've played a few games with these expansions and we've just added the Kings of Middle Earth. So we understand, I wouldn't recommend throwing them all at once. I recommend adding one expansion at a time. But by the time you build up to Kings of Middle Earth, the extra information doesn't feel overwhelming. Uh, as I said, it feels like it just taps on top. It's another system to add to your existing understanding. The fact that it doesn't change any rules. The fact that it's another simple system means that none of this is overwhelming. It means that I'm very comfortable playing with all three expansions pretty much in every future time I play the game. I can see no reason why I would remove any expansion of the game. This is certainly Lords of Middle-earth. It's such an easy integration. It enhances the Elven Ring. The Warriors of Middle-earth, as I said, probably the biggest change adds the factions, but I think they're really good. It doesn't, you're not doing a lot with these factions. Typically, as I said, you're doing one thing with the factions each turn. This is subtle. It's a subtle little, uh, subtle little almost game on top of the game. Um, which adds those new characters. But yeah, again, to reiterate, nothing overwhelming. So just to, to kind of reiterate and, and summarize, all three expansions are great. All three add in subtly different ways to the flavor, the theme, and the narrative that is shaped, all in line pretty much with you know, the Lord of the Rings, story and universe and characters uh, it just adds to those stories in our in our case the southrons and easterlings attacked the woodland realm um, <clears throat> the elves rose up and were able to recruit and again it just adds to that story in a little bit more detail than what you would get with the base game um, so yeah that's pretty much my summary i recommend all three expansions I wouldn't throw them all in at once. I recommend introducing one at a time. Uh, the, uh, the Lords of Middle-earth is probably the easiest to integrate and understand. Warriors of Middle-earth is probably the most value in terms of enhancing gameplay. Kings of Middle-earth enhances gameplay in a different way by adding the more characters and more sort of flavor to uh, those characters. There's a lot more detail and sort of, um, Oh yeah, just more story surrounding those characters and their impact on the game. So folks, again, I hope this has been of, of benefit. I, uh, yeah, hope it's been informative. Thank you everyone for watching and take care.